Welcome everyone to another edition of Fair Territory. I hope everyone had a great Memorial Weekend. Maybe took some time to reflect on those who gave the ultimate sacrifice. This is a very important holiday in our country. But of course, we have a lot of baseball to discuss, as we always do. And Memorial Day, as many of you know, is an important check mark, kind of a milepost in the season. Usually comes at about the one-third mark, with about one-third of the games played. And teams at this point can really start assessing themselves and seeing where they are. Now, I went on my it's not early diatribe a few weeks ago, but it's really not early now. And I want to start by talking about some teams, seven teams, in fact, that reached the postseason last year, but I would say qualify as disappointments thus far. So I want to show you these teams, and then we'll go through it a little bit. It starts with the Seattle Mariners. I'm going to almost exempt them from this list. I kept them on because the two games above 500. That's not where they want to be. But they're at least 16 and 10 in May. The Blue Jays, they have not played the way anyone has expected. They lost 9 of 11 to the AL East at one point, rallied over the weekend, 2 of 3 over the Minnesota Twins. The Mets, well, you look at the record, you can see that the most expensive team in history is a disappointment. Coming off a 2 and 4 trip to Wrigley and Coors after their five game winning streak, the Phillies. It's a World Series hangover. Their record is not all that much better than it was last year when Joe Girardi got fired. They've got some issues. Cleveland Guardians, lowest scoring team in the majors. Cardinals, arguably the most disappointing team in the majors. They looked like they were getting hot. Then they had a rough road trip to Cincinnati and Cleveland. Lose 7-0 to the Royals. On Memorial Day, yes, they played 18 games in 18 days. I get it, but my goodness, every team goes through this. And then the San Diego Padres arguably the most disappointing team in baseball, even beyond the Cardinals. I should have mentioned them that way. The Padres have lost 14 of 20. For whatever reason, they have not taken off yet. And again, we're at a point in the season now where things start to become a little bit worrisome for teams like that, to say the least. Now, you might say, whoa, whoa, look at recent history. We've had some teams get off to really rough starts and come back and make the World Series, even win the World Series. Yes, that is true. And I'm going to show you these teams right now. We can talk about them. Patrick Mooney of The Athletic referred to these clubs in an article about the Cubs. We'll get to them in a second. And here you see it. Yeah, the 2019 Nationals, 19-31 and 31 on May 23rd, won the World Series. 2021 Braves, they were still below 500 in August. Of course, made all those great trades at the deadline, won the World Series. 2022 Phillies, they fire their manager, Joe Girardi. They ultimately, with Rob Thompson, go on to the World Series. Tremendous run in the playoffs. But they lose the World Series. Still, a positive outcome. Okay, yes, there is recent history to suggest that some of the teams I just showed you on that list, some of the uber-talented teams in particular, have a chance to do some big things still. And if you go to fan graphs and you look at their playoff odds, They've still got the Mets and Padres above 50%. Not much above 50%, but above. The problem with all this for those seven teams is, yeah, one, two, maybe even three of them go on big runs. Maybe even four of them. But they're not all going to go on big runs. And there are going to be some interesting things that happen over the next two months leading to the deadline to see if these teams fortify themselves, to see if they start to play better. It's all in play. Now, of course, I'm not mentioning here the positive surprises we have in the game. Texas Rangers foremost among them, Baltimore Orioles as well, Arizona Diamondbacks. I would even put the San Francisco Giants on this list. They've played much better of late. But what stands out to me on Memorial Day are those seven teams, the Mets and Padres in particular, and yes, the Cardinals too, that have yet to put it together. Now, I was in Chicago over the weekend for Reds at Cubs. Reds swept that series. Marcus Stroman, big performance yesterday against the Rays. Snaps the losing streak with a one-hit shutout. Just brilliant. But the Cubbies are in trouble. They were climbed out of last place with that win yesterday, climbing just over the Cardinals. But they, too, have been an immensely disappointing team. They start off the season 12-7. and Since then, they're 11-23, and and there are problems all over the place. The offense... When you look at their individual numbers, go player by player, it's not that bad. It's actually kind of impressive. 
But overall, they are not an impressive offense. And there is a metric that Fangraphs uses called clutch. It's a measure of offensive performance in high leverage situations. The Cubs are last in that metric, and the distance between them and the 29th team is almost as great as the distance between the 29th team and the first. So offensively, the Cubs have underperformed. The bullpen, though, has probably been the biggest problem. And I can show you, over the years, last few years, I should say, they've been pretty successful at signing one-year relievers and turning them into something, getting good performances out of them. Here are some examples, and the president of baseball operations, Jed Hoyer, actually referred to this group earlier this week. Chafin, Tapera, Chris Martin, Michael Givens, and David Robertson, the latter three, all traded at the deadline last year. So the Cubs have done well in this regard, but this year they've missed. Boxberger did not perform well, goes on the injured list. Michael Fulmer has had a horrible run. I'm not even talking about Jamison Tyone in the rotation, who also has been a major disappointment. Their bullpen has been a problem. It has brought scrutiny to the manager, David Ross. Hoyer defended Ross last week by basically saying, yeah, but in the past, we've gotten better performances out of the guys we've signed, and I didn't do a very good job signing the ones we got this year. Keegan Thompson, also a disappointment back in the minors. So the Cubs have a number of different issues going on here. And I wrote this weekend, I talked to Marcus Stroman about this, the possibility of a sell-off. Now, our Cubs beat writers at The Athletic, Patrick Mooney and Sahadev Sharma, they've been writing about this for about a week now, and it's sheer reality for this team, stark reality. If they don't turn it around, they're going to probably make some moves at the deadline that are not the kind that they were envisioning at the start of the season. Stroman is a guy who has an opt-out at the end of the year, obvious choice to trade. He's pitching extremely well. All season long, he has. Drew Smiley, he's a little bit older, he's 35. He is also a guy that could be on the move. He has an opt-out clause that kicks in if he reaches 110 innings. He's on pace to do just that, to exceed that total. So he could be someone that brings them something. And Cody Bellinger, once he gets healthy, he too could, in a trade, perhaps bring a decent return. The problem with all this is that the Cubs' rebuild is supposed to be accelerating at this point. They're supposed to be on the rise, not kind of middling along again. And yet, this is where they are. So they have a big two months in front of them. They have got to get it together. Because this is an improving division. The Pirates have fallen off since their 20-9 and nine start. They are now under 500, but they have some interesting young players. The Reds, we're going to get to them. I sort of love where they are, even though they're not a perfect team by any stretch of the imagination. But they're coming, too. The Cardinals, you have to figure they're going to play better. They need pitching at the deadline. There's not much issue or question about that, starting pitching in particular. And then the Brewers are the Brewers. They're always there. They've got huge injury problems, yet they're still in first place. So the Cubs are in a very winnable division. That's winnable for all of these teams. And yet they cannot seemingly get going. So the Cubs have a lot of questions and a lot of decisions to face in the coming weeks. Finally, let's talk about a team that ended an 11-game losing streak yesterday. A team that, well, really hasn't played all that well this season, you might have noticed. A team that is 11-45 and 45 now. You know who I'm talking about. The Oakland A's. They are back, I should say, back on a 32-win pace. That would leave them at, let's see, 32-130 and 130 for the season. Their run differential, which has been shockingly bad, historically bad, now at negative 194. We've talked about the A's a lot with regard to their stadium. We haven't talked a lot about their play. Their play's been terrible. And their front office has to own some of this. They did not bring in quality veterans. They perhaps trusted too many kids in that rotation. They did get Paul Blackburn back yesterday. He gave them a start. He's a respectable starting pitcher in this league. All-star last season. That helped. But at the same time, they designated Jesus Aguilar for assignment. They're horrible. They're going to stay horrible. I don't see it getting better. And while they have some interesting young pieces, and while Rooker has been a great story in the early going, come on, man. They're not very good at all. So the Oakland A's, keep your eyes on them. We've seen some teams be bad in the past. I'll show you two of them right now. 
the New York Mets in 1962, the expansion Mets, 40 and 120. 120 is the record number of losses in modern baseball history. And then the 1899 Cleveland Spiders. Now, the A's, I would assume, are going to finish up better than the Spiders, but mm -hmm. even though the Spiders played a 154-game schedule, I would say nothing is guaranteed. The A's are sitting on 11 wins. So let's see them get to 21 before we start proclaiming them better than the Spiders in 1899. Either way, this is not a conversation any team wants to be having at any point. This is a historically bad team. And it's a team that has brought a lot of unwanted attention on itself at a time when it's considering relocation. I wrote about this last week. You might have read it. I would suggest go back and look at it again because to me, and I've said this on foul territory, I've said it on fair territory, I've said it ad nauseum. They're an embarrassment. And if I was an owner of another team, I'd be looking at that before saying, hey guys, go to Las Vegas, no relocation fee, we're good. Time now for the inside dish. This is the segment in which I go sometimes inside a story that I might have written over the week or go a little deeper on something that might be developing in Major League Baseball. This week I want to talk about a story that I wrote with Trent Rosecrans, our Reds beat writer, one of our best the other day, and it was a story about the Reds' impending roster crunch with the arrival of one of the game's top prospects, Ellie De La Cruz, switch hitting shortstop, described to me by some Reds people as a switch hitting Tatis with upside. Think about that for a minute. The problem with Ellie De La Cruz joining the Reds, and it's one of these proverbial good problems to have, is that it might lead to the displacement of one of their best players, their heart and soul, their unquestioned leader, yes, even with Joey Votto on the team, and that player is Jonathan India. Jonathan India is their second baseman. He was the 2021 National League Rookie of the Year, and yet, just two years later, the Reds are so loaded with infielders, middle infielders in particular, that they have this situation developing where it might end up Ellie De La Cruz is at shortstop, and Matt McClain, another one of their top prospects, is at second base. That would be probably the alignment that at second base would give them their best defense. India, good offensive player, not as good a defender as McClain at second base. So Trent and I combined on this story, kind of laying out all of the issues. Now, normally, when I write a story or a column, anything at all, I don't look at tweets in response, and I don't look at fan comments under the story, which we do in The Athletic. The reason for that is that fans have a different agenda than sports writers do. Fans worry about their team. They want writers, in many cases, not all, to kind of wave the pom-poms, tell them what they want to hear, and that's not our job. Also, I find in this day and age, Reading comprehension is a real issue. Now, I don't know what's going on in schools today, but people are not always understanding what they're reading. And this story, which I thought was a relatively innocuous story about a fascinating situation with the Reds, an intriguing team that is playing better, that has this amazing prospect, and yet has this roster crunch looming. Really interesting stuff about a team that's been down for a few years. Well, this story got some fan reaction that kind of boggled my mind, for lack of a better term. Some people said we were overthinking it. Uh, no, the Reds are thinking about this quite a bit right now. Some people accused us of clickbait. No, The Athletic is a subscription site, and you can't have clickbait on a subscription site. You either click if you're a subscriber or you don't. And then finally, there was a tweet from ESPN's Kirk Herbstreet. Now, Kirk, of course... Big time announcer, legendary guy, and he writes, This team hasn't had a leader that pushed his teammates every day since Scott Rowland left in 2012, and we finally have that guy, and you write this article? India's value goes far beyond the numbers. As excited as we all are about the young talent coming up, India needs to be the rock and catalyst for years to come, put Dela Cruz in the outfield, and move on. Well, I certainly appreciate all reader comments, and... It's all part of it. People can say what they want to say, including Kirk, who, of course, is in the media and has somewhat of a more valid opinion than some would. At the same time, I would suggest Kirk read the article again. And I would suggest everyone who is rising up in defense of Jonathan India to read the article again. 
Because the article, which was mostly written by Trent, deals with the fact that India has extreme value to this team, both on and off the field. And for that reason, while it would be easy to trade him from a pure numbers perspective, it's really difficult to trade him because of what he means to the club. Now, I talked to Jonathan India about this whole situation this weekend in Chicago. He's quite aware of what's going on. His reaction was just fine. He basically said, listen, there are always guys coming up behind you in this game. Always. And what I have to do is just focus on what I can focus on. Helping my team win, playing the best I can, making the decision as tough as I can for them. So, I would advise, again, people who read the article and didn't understand that it really quite delicately and carefully outlined what Jonathan India means to this team. Yeah, he means a ton to this team. And that's why this is such a quandary for the Reds. Yes, they're thinking about it. Their GM's thinking about it. Their manager's thinking about it. Their coaches are thinking about it. They're trying to figure this out. Now, you can say, move Jonathan India to left field. Move him to third base. But at third base, the Reds have other players. Nick Senzel's playing well there now. Christian Encarnacion Strand, another top prospect, he's coming. Now, he ultimately might be a DH, and you can use India at the DH spot as well, but it might be that you need Christian Encarnacion Strand there, and you might want Senzel at third. India at third base, his arm might be a little short. Same in left field. His arm might be short there. So there's no obvious spot to move Jonathan India. Now, Kirk Herbstreet suggested Dela Cruz to the outfield. Center field, maybe, Right? Here's a guy who's a tremendous athlete, and I'm sure he could handle it, much like Tatis has with San Diego. But at least right now, the Reds still view him as a shortstop. And really, the way he's playing, you have to promote him probably within the next few weeks, if not sooner. And you're not going to have a position switch in the middle of a season. So there are all these things in play, including Spencer Steer at first base, who has proven himself to be a pretty good player for them, a Rookie of the Year candidate, kind of in a stealth way. Maybe you move him to the outfield. You've got Votto possibly coming back. You've got all of these balls up in the air. And this is why we studied this, analyzed it, wrote about it. Because it's a really interesting situation. It's not going away anytime soon. Once Ellie De La Cruz gets here, and he's getting here soon, it's going to be a real thing. Time now for the Dude and Dork of the Week. Some weeks, it's difficult to choose a Dude of the Week, difficult to narrow down when you've got a lot of great candidates. Other weeks, it's not so difficult. This week, it is not difficult at all. In fact, this might be the easiest choice I'll ever make in awarding a Dude of the Week. I used to do this on the radio in Baltimore. We're doing it now on this show. The Dude of the Week, quite obviously, is Chicago White Sox closer Liam Hendricks. Comes back Sunday night from non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, appears at the Sox Park, comes out of the bullpen, standing ovation, people just greeting him, loving that he came back in this way. Now, Liam Hendricks, yes, he gave up two runs last night. I hardly think that is the story here. He was diagnosed in December, as you see right there. And here we are in May. And he underwent chemo, he underwent treatment, and obviously went through a lot mentally, emotionally, and physically, and yet remained committed to his team. And the best thing about Liam Hendricks, even beyond the fact that he's pitching again, is that he's trying to take a negative and make it a positive, as he always does. There are charitable efforts underway with the White Sox and with Liam himself. They gave a $100,000 check last night to the Lymphoma Research Foundation. That was money raised by the sale of closeout cancer t-shirts. Liam Hendricks, just a shining light right now in our sport. And for that, he is the dude of the week. Dork of the week. Well, we sort of hit on this area a lot or this subject matter a lot. But come on, it's the gift that keeps on giving when it comes to dorks. Now, this week, we're not going to give it to John Fisher, the Oakland A's owner. We're not going to give it to Rob Manfred, the baseball commissioner. No, we're going to give it to the Nevada lawmakers who held a public hearing on a bill that would give the A's public funding to relocate to Las Vegas. And they held this hearing on Memorial Day. And they held it about an hour before the hockey team in Las Vegas, the Golden Knights, advanced to the Stanley Cup final last night. So you've got it on a holiday, 
And you've got it on a night when people are distracted by the performance of the hockey team, which was a big performance, gets them to the final. I mean, come on. Now, I get it that the legislative session closes out on Monday, a week from today as we tape this. At the same time, maybe you could have pushed the hearing to Tuesday. Or maybe you didn't want the public really paying attention to this hearing because you're ready to commit up to $380 million in public funds to a $1.5 billion 30,000 seat ballpark. I don't know the true motivations. I merely asked the question here, but you know, Nevada lawmakers, what you were doing. You know what you did, as my daughter always says. Nevada lawmakers, dorks of the week, and guess what? You may be suckers of the week if you prove this deal. This week on Fox, we've got Yankees at Dodgers from Dodger Stadium. Great matchup, two of the game's most storied franchises and most successful. Two teams that are playing pretty well this year, despite some obstacles, injury obstacles, other things that have happened. What I'm looking to see here is how these teams sort through their rotations. Now, we have Garrett Cole lined up for Saturday. The Dodgers starter is listed as Gavin Stone, but I'm suspecting and people have reported that it might be Michael Grove. The Dodgers have a number of these young pitchers. Bobby Miller was brilliant on Sunday. They're trying to find the right pieces to fit which guys will be best. Syndergaard has not been good. Kershaw not good in the month of May. And then the Yankees, when Cole is not pitching, well, Severino's back, but they're still awaiting Rodon. It's going to be really interesting to see how these teams sort through it and how they get through it. Okay, let's move on to something that I was not sure was going to work. I was a little dubious about when our producer, Jeremy Meyer, gave me the idea, but actually it was a great idea. And you guys responded. We asked for something different. We asked for the fan questions to be submitted, not just in print on Twitter or wherever, but we asked you guys to submit some videos and to go about it that way so we can involve you in the process from a video perspective. Well, it worked. We've got some great questions. Let's start with the first. Yo, what's up, Ken? My name's Garrett. I um, was just wondering, what's the craziest thing you've heard while you were in a dugout? Garrett, this is a good question. The truth is, I don't hear much down there because it's so loud in the stadium, and I'm a little bit removed. I'm not in the dugout. I'm an, usually a camera well that is adjoining the dugout. But I will tell you two stories about things I have heard that are actually kind of cool. The first goes back to the NLCS last year when I was in the dugout at times. The times were when something big would happen in the game. And you guys remember, I would interview players after big moments. So Harper hit a home run off Yu Darvish, the Phillies' Bryce Harper, Padres' Yu Darvish. And I'm in the dugout waiting to get Bryce Harper, trying to arrange an interview. She's just basically trying to signal him to come over. And I hear Harper yell, stay on the heater. I thought that was pretty cool. What he was doing was telling his teammates to stay on Darvish's fastball. That's where to get him. That's where he's vulnerable. So naturally, I said this on the air. Naturally, that was kind of gray area on what I could and couldn't report from when I was in the dugout. So we had a little bit of a conversation with Major League Baseball after that. Turned out okay. No one was too upset. But I think in the future and from that point on, I sort of stayed away from reporting things I directly heard while in the dugout waiting for an interview. The other one didn't happen in the dugout, but it happened at Wrigley Field before they sort of remodeled the camera wells down there, did some things to expand them, make the sight lines easier. So I go on the pregame show one Saturday and I talk about Carlos Zambrano. Remember him? And I talk about a contract situation that he was involved with, with the Cubs negotiations. I don't recall exactly what I said. I do recall Zambrano in the middle of the game, walking to the end of the dugout, signaling me to come over and talk to him. Now, Carlos, you might remember, was a pretty emotional guy. I don't know that he was terribly upset, but he was gesturing and making all his points and kind of just unwittingly making this a public thing because everyone could see it and the cameras could see it. If I recall correctly, Joe Buck joked about it, but more Interestingly, the Cubs general manager at the time, Jim Hendry, he calls me on my cell phone after this happens. He says, what the hell is going on down there? I said, hey, Jim, no problem. It's just Carlos and I having a conversation about what I reported. He was concerned that it was actually uglier than he might have thought, that it was a real argument, a real confrontation, when it wasn't that at all. It was just Carlos being Carlos, and that was how it 
went down. My name is Mason, and I was wondering, in your opinion, what has been the most surprising team this season, whether it's been overperforming or underperforming? Mason, good question. We dealt with some of the underperformers in our first segment. The Mets and Padres certainly would be the biggest surprises there. But let's talk overperformance. And maybe it's not overperformance when you sustain it this long and when you play at the level that this team is playing at. And I'm talking about the Texas Rangers. I did not see this coming. I sure didn't see it coming without Jacob deGrom being a major participant, and he has not been. This team has gotten great work out of its rotation, but the one thing that I definitely underestimated, and maybe other people did as well, was the offense. Their offense is outstanding, one of the best in the league, and they've gone stretches without Seager and Mitch Garver. They've had some things happen offensively that weren't so good, and yet here they are, this absolute behemoth offensively, one to nine. So I would say for sure, Mason, they were the team that surprised me the most from an overperformance standpoint this year. Spencer Reyes, big Mets fan here. And I want to know what moves can the Mets make to improve on their team only going 500 so far this season? Really, really struggling. I agree, Spencer. And they're going to make some moves to the deadline. I don't know that there's much doubt about that. And I would expect their moves are reinforcements from a pitching perspective. We've seen them promote Brett Beatty. We've seen them promote Francisco Alvarez, Vientos. Yes, Mauricio is still down there. I don't know that they're going to be able to squeeze him in as well, but they have made some moves to improve their offense, and the offense has gotten slightly better. It still lacks power for me. I still think they need one more big slugger. Maybe Beatty turns into that guy. Maybe Alvarez is that guy. I don't know. But their bigger issues, it seems to me, are going to be, again, on the pitching staff. Now, if Verlander and Scherzer are healthy and pitching well and Carlos Carrasco is able to build on what he did in his first start, they should be okay. But I would expect they'll still be in the market for a starter, and yes, they need bullpen help as well. Without Edwin Diaz, it's not the same combination as it was last year. There's no question about that. So that is where I see the Mets looking as we get closer to the deadline. But stay tuned. Injuries can affect that. Performance can affect that. All kinds of things can change in the next two months. Hey, my name is Owen Lapp. Um, Will Farrell is discussing playing John Madden in an upcoming film, so I was wondering who should play Ken in a movie about his career. Thanks, Owen. One thing about your question, which I appreciate, of course, I don't believe anyone in Hollywood is even considering a movie about any sports writer, much less me, anytime soon. But let's run with your idea. Let's go with this. So I thought about it. Arnold Schwarzenegger probably would not be the choice. John Cena probably would not be the choice. Brad Pitt, I don't think he would be the guy either. Besides, he's already played Billy Bean, right? So I asked my wife this question this morning. I said, hey, if someone ever had to play me in a movie, who do you think it would be? She actually had a good suggestion. Her suggestion was Harry Potter, but not Harry Potter. Daniel Radcliffe. And the reason she said Daniel Radcliffe was, as you guys well know from looking at me on Fox, seeing me interview Aaron Judge like this, I'm not the biggest guy in the world. Daniel Radcliffe, not the biggest guy in the world either. So he would be my choice. Now, if this had been maybe 10 years ago, and we're way overthinking this, perhaps Dustin Hoffman would have been the guy. The problem with Dustin Hoffman is he played Carl Bernstein in All the President's Men, Carl Bernstein. Bob Woodward, you might remember them. Bob Woodward, played by Robert Redford. I believe what Woodward and Bernstein did from a journalistic perspective was just slightly more important than what I do on a daily basis. All right, thanks everyone for watching. Thanks everyone for listening. Remember, you can subscribe to us on YouTube or like us. And of course, you can subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts. Have a great week, everyone. We'll be back next week on our regular day. That will be Monday. Thanks again. Foul Territory fans, listen up. Our friends at BetMGM are running an MLB Bet $10, get $100 instantly promo with the bonus code SPICYMLB. Here's how it works. Sign up and deposit at least $10 into your newly created account. Download the BetMGM Sportsbook app on iOS or Android. Place a pregame money line wager of at least $10 on any MLB team to win at standard odds price, and you will receive $100 in bonus bets instantly. If you sign up in Massachusetts or Ohio, you receive $200 in bonus bets. Use the bonus code SPICYMLB. 